Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Monday, February 1st. First, we take a look at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale. Actually, the gale, low pressure, is over Nevada now. High pressure off the coast, forming a gradient, making for brisk northwest winds along the California coast, and generating seas to 20 foot, but of no real interest, mainly just chop. Of way more interest is a storm developing with good winds, just west of the date line, with seas in the 34-foot range and on the increase. Let's get into the details. We'll take a look at jet stream level winds. These winds help support gale formation, and when those gales do form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough. That is a little dip in the jet stream. We see a little tiny dip right here, uh, supported by an area of, what is that, about 160 knot winds running flat off Japan across the date line to a point almost north of Hawaii. This is actually the weakest the jet has been in a month or more, uh, but that won't last very long. Also notice a split here in the jet. That is, there's a track or a branch of it going to the north, a branch going to the south, right here at about 150 west. This is key in that it is going to, if it persists, uh, reduce the amount of storm activity and therefore rain moving into the California coast and instead set up high pressure. The thought being that if this occurs, it's probably attributable to the inactive phase of the MJO, which is in control now. Let's get into the details. We'll roll through this. You see the jet quickly building here. What is that? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, 170 knot winds building off Japan on Tuesday. A well developed trough starting to form here. That support, supports counterclockwise flow aloft and down at the surface. That is the hallmark of low pressure and or storms and gales. And that's what, of course, what produces surf. Roll this out a little bit more. And the, draw, the trough kind of washes out some by Wednesday, but notice winds continue building here. And this this is all driven by the uh, El Nino base state. Irrespective of the MJO, El Nino is in control globally, and, it, and where it shows or where it has its largest impact is in the jet stream, and then everything follows from the jet stream. If the jet stream is strong, storms are strong, and that dictates the storm track, etc., etc. Anyway, so we get into Wednesday. The jet stream just continues to build, looking more solid, almost 190 knot winds here. Notice the split still holding just about a little bit east of Hawaii, northeast of Hawaii. Roll this out, and there it is between the split jet stream flow that you get ca you get a, a clockwise circulation high pressure, and that is what is going to take over in California here shortly. Anyway, but back to the to the west, jet stream remains strong, broad kind of trophy pattern trying to set up again, classic kind of El Nino setup here, and then sure enough, come uh, Friday night, 190 knot winds in the jet, new trough starts building, high pressure holds over California, we'll roll this out, again, a very good, strong looking trough into Saturday, and then even more so, what is that, a hundred, uh, 200 knot winds falling into the trough, just providing more energy, agitating the atmosphere more into Sunday, and the beat just goes on. It just holds in this sort of semi-static pattern uh, for the next week, basically, high pressure and control. So what that means is probably a light wind pattern along the U.S. West Coast, if not light offshores. Dry, unfortunately. Re precipitation is good, but the snow base is great up in the Sierras, so that there is a little bit of a uh, silver lining to everything for the moment. And the storm track just continues to look very solid. Let's go down to the surface. And here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds, and as expected, high pressure here off the U.S. West Coast, 1032 millibars, that's fairly strong, and here you can see it, low pressure, weak, but still forms a good pressure gradient. Difference in pressure between the low pressure and the high pressure creates winds, that in, in this case is northwest winds, 30 knots per the 18Z uh, run of the model on Monday off the central California coast into southern California, and a basic look out the window tells you that, in fact, the ocean surface is quite agitated and ugly. Um, now, what this also shows clearly is a storm. And this is two shades of purple, 60 to 65 knot winds per the model. That's fairly strong. That imparts a lot of wind energy on into the ocean's surface and can create long period swell. We'll roll this out, and that system continues into this evening, and even 60 knot winds till 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Uh, 
and then starts to fade out on Tuesday, but still 55 knot winds, fairly strong, not a huge system, but fairly uh, persistent. Then it finally fades out uh, late Tuesday, still remnants circulating in the Gulf, high pressure trying to hang. Notice a little bit of a front tries to wheel into central California here on Wednesday, and it succeeds, but then by Thursday, high pressure in control. Some flavor of an offshore flow is expected, depending on where you are, and thus weak stormy pattern continues in the Gulf until you get to, here we go, Friday, another little gale forecast, small area, 45 knot winds, almost 50 knot winds there, a little, so sort of a split identity storm initially, Northwest winds here targeting Hawaii, south winds targeting, of course, Alaska. And this system now builds stronger, a little dash of 55 knot winds there into Saturday, and it continues and then sort of fades out. But a secondary little fetch forms under that on Sunday traveling east it fades out and now this is all new here another gale system of some sort is expected almost a week out here on the dateline not unexpected though given the uh, configuration of the jet stream and yet more storm energy again forming here off Japan the thought being with the split jet stream flow most of the storm activity will now uh, retrograde a little bit compared to where it's been the past three or four weeks where it was sort of focused right here in the core of the Gulf of Alaska now to move back towards the Dateline area and, uh, again, driven by the inactive phase of the MJO. So here we are, significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. Of course, we saw the little area off of Southern California and our newly developing storm. This will be the eighth storm of the season so far. Pretty good. Um, uh, right now, 30, was that? Two, four, almost 36. Well, it says 37.7, one tiny grib square here. That's a half a degree by a half a degree. But reality, we'll say about 36 feet, practically speaking. Anyway, we'll put this into motion. And things quickly evolve with 60 knot plus one winds in the core of this system and by late tonight we're talking 48 foot seas and then first thing tomorrow morning that's 5 a.m california time we're into the 50 it says 51 but effectively 50 foot seas aimed well to the east with sideband energy towards hawaii continuing into about 10 a.m in the morning 18 z on tuesday uh again 52 foot uh, i'm sorry 49 foot seas and then it slowly fades out from there. So a rather short-lived system, but very potent and imparting a fair amount of energy quickly to the ocean surface. And it really doesn't take long for seas to respond. And also remember now, this whole, the North Pacific is well agitated. Uh, there's probably a steady background 10-foot sea state at any point in time from the date we're, date line to the Gulf of Alaska. So any wind, you know, any solid fetch that develops instantly starts in, uh, uh, generating seas and it ramps up rather quickly from there. Anyway, so uh, persistent, some sort of uh, background energy going on the Gulf through Thursday with oh, 22, 24 foot seas fades out. And then our next system develops come uh, Friday evening, 30 foot seas building. So this is much stronger than even the 12 Z run this, this morning. Now with 43 foot seas, I think it got up to 40 foot at one point this morning and hanging pretty nicely in the Gulf. Most of this energy bound for the U.S. West Coast. Here's that secondary system that's now forecast coming rather close to Hawaii with a good amount of, what is that, oh, 30 foot seas. So you'll get, but being so close, probably good for 15, 16 second period, somewhat raw jumbled swell coming into the islands. And then we move on into the whoops uh, week out on Tuesday. And here comes the next system moving through the Gulf of Alaska. So even though we're in the inactive phase of the MJO, the El Nino base state is continuing to fuel the jet stream. The jet stream continues to fuel storm development, and the beat just goes on. This is good. So point in reference. Currently, we are at storm number, I believe it was eight for the this El Nino 2015-2016 winter. During the 97 El Nino, there was 39 significant class storms through the life of El Nino, of that El Nino. We do not expect to reach that number. If we get to 20 or so, that would be pretty good, but we'll see. Weirder things have happened. The pattern is well dug in. It's basically like a machine at this point. It's like having our own little private swell generation machine that's focusing on Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. And uh, so really, the only issue is weather in Hawaii, which has been rather good. 
California, Northern California, the dividing line, Monterey Bay, north of there has been a windblown mess. Southern California, conversely, has done pretty well, and on down into Baja. And let's do a quick inspection here of this next storm, storm number uh, number eight, and see how it's going to do, at least in terms of great circle paths here relative to Hawaii. And this is as of uh, late Sunday night, it was already putting energy down about the 307 degree, degree track to Hawaii. But notice how its track is almost going perpendicular to the great circle paths into the islands here by... Uh, by Monday morning, it was on about the 317 degree track, and then pretty much all notice the wind that the uh, swell wave direction arrows here bypassing. So that was pretty much it. So whatever energy it gets is going to be down in the 320 or so degree angle. Now relative to Northern California, we'll go back again, and here we go, starting at about 283 degrees and building but the most of the energy is right in here in about the 292 to 294 or so degree track and then of course we got to take a look at southern california as well let's do that right here starting on about the 287 degree track but again most of the energy gets wrapped up here into about the 295 to Oh, 290, well, peak of it right there. That's where the longest period energy will be generated on about the 298 degree track. So uh, select your uh, brakes accordingly for, for uh, arrival of the swell. Let's talk about long-term projections. Of course, the focus is El Nino 2015-2016 and the long-term goals or productive capacity for it in terms of swell production. First up, we look at winds in the Kelvin wave generation area. Not that we expect a Kelvin wave to be generated, but winds in that area help dictate the amount of energy that's imparted in the jet if it's not directly El Nino related. Currently, we see east winds in control, but a rather calm pattern south, a little bit south of the equator. And the area we're interested in here is from 135 to about 165 west so right here not the whole pacific ocean trades always dominate in this area but during el nino trades fade over in here in what we call the kelvin wave generation area and that also has influence on the jet stream and the amount of energy in the jet stream but even to a certain extent now that's not so important because el nino is basically in control of the pattern still we see a somewhat weak wind flow here south of the equator but trades seem to be dominating but differences in normal for this time of year again same area 165 some right around in here because there's no wind south of the equator that's the equivalent of a west wind pattern and you can actually see here weak west anomalies here in the southern kelvin wave generation area and here is the kelvin wave generation area here five north to five south from about 135 east out to the date line. It goes a little bit east to here, but this you get the general idea here. And you can see the current set up here. Basically, a light wind pattern south of the equator on down to five south, but trades in control in the, uh, what is that, about uh, 18 knot, up to 18 knots in the northern half of the uh, Kelvin wave generation area. We'll just run this out real quick. This is actually the peak of these easterly anomalies, if you will. And notice they work themselves the whole way down here almost to the southern Kelvin wave generation area through about Thursday. And then the pattern falls apart. And again, it turns into almost dead calm winds, the southern half of the Kelvin wave generation area, well, while trades, but much lighter, are in the northern half and even kind of backing off from there, which is a good thing out for a week. No westerly winds indicated, actually a little tad bit there, but basically a light wind pattern, which should manifest itself in terms of anomalies, in terms of a light westerly anomaly pattern. We'll go back a couple days to put things in perspective. The Kelvin wave generation area is this box. You can't see it, but we'll draw it here roughly about like that. And you can see sort of a, the reds are westerly anomalies. And you can kind of see it here. This is the 27th of January, 28th, 29th, 30th. Just a very weak westerly anomaly pattern. Here's another way to look at past history. So the Kelvin, this is the whole globe going from 
west to east. Uh, the, the date line is right here. Kelvin wave generation area runs a line down about here it's to somewhere around, somewhere about right there. Major westerly wind burst occurred starting in late December uh, through the middle part of January. The reds are, and the, the whites or purples here, are uh, westerly anomalies. The blues are easterly anomalies, but notice this is not in the Kelvin wave generation area. And so here we are. Here's where we are today. Very spotty, weak westerly anomalies since this big uh, uh, westerly wind burst in the mid-January time frame petered out. And here's the forecast for the next week. I mean, basically nothing compared to what we've been used to this year. But that's not unexpected. One, because we're in the inactive phase of the MJO. Normally the MJO, at least the theory was, isn't even supposed to be in play during a strong El Nino. But clearly it is during this El Nino for whatever reason. And two, um, so it, so the uh, inactive phase sort of uh, mutes or, or has a what they call a destructive interference with uh, El Nino, but not completely. Still, weak westerly anomalies are to persist for the next week. Now we take a look uh, at the MJO, and we said the inactive phase is in control, and you can see that pretty clear here. This is the statistic model. Now this is outgoing long wave radiation, not winds, but it's basically close to the same thing. Uh, oranges, yellows are uh, more sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, suggesting high pressure, whereas blues are less sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, suggesting cloudiness. This suggests the active phase of the MJO is over Indonesia, the inactive phase over the dateline. The statistic model for the next 15 days suggests basically a, a steady state pattern. The active phase may be inching its way to the east a little bit while the inactive phase weakens. The dynamic model, think of it like the GEFS model, su suggests a steady state pattern or if anything the inactive phase is to get more entrenched while the active phase gets more entrenched. So probably reality is somewhere between the two. And yet another way to view where the active phase of the MJO is. This is uh, using uh, these phase diagrams, looking down from the top of the planet down towards the equator. Let's say we have a uh, maritime continent. So uh, let's say the New Zealand area roughly here, Indonesia, to moving to the West Pacific, moving across the Americas into the Atlantic, and then across Africa and into the Indian Ocean back that way around. And the uh, active phase of the MJO moves counterclockwise around this diagram. The further from the center you are, the stronger the active phase is. Currently, per the ECMF model, it suggests we are in a weak active phase over basically the maritime continent, so Indonesia roughly. This other model, the GEFS, says basically the same sort of thing. Now, the ECMF has the active phase moving into the West Pacific two weeks out. The GF GEFS has it holding stationary. A selection of other models show pretty much, what do we have, six different models here, and they're all somewhere scattered between stationary and moving slightly to the east. So basically nothing new here. It's basically unknown what the MJO is going to do, but the guess is probably some slight eastward movement. Now, our favorite model is the CFS version 2 model. It has done a very good job, this El Nino, of modeling what's happened and, well, of what's to come. So, in this chart here, here's what's happened. Reds and oranges are westerly wind bursts. Here's the date line running right up the middle of the chart. The Kelvin wave generation area runs, so oh, somewhere along here to over and around here. Okay, we had a big westerly wind burst in October that generated Kelvin wave number four. We had an even bigger westerly wind burst, as we talked about, starting late December into January. That has created Kelvin wave number five. And now another westerly wind burst is forecast starting in the, oh, about the 20th of February on into middle of March, something like that. And that is, let's add the MJO overlay. So you notice the two previous westerly wind bursts, this red solid line is the active phase of the MJO, active phase of the MJO. Notice west winds died out during the inactive phase. Currently, here we are in the inactive phase, and you can see the oranges, well, the yellows are barely there. So basically, we're going to have to suffer for about, eh, what is that, 
about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And then, and if the store machine continues to be productive, as it actually looks like it's going to be, then even during the downtime, that doesn't mean the swell generation machine is going to back off. It will continue, but it will probably mean that precipitation into California will back off some. And then as we move into this period here with the active MJO, then the split jet stream that we've been talking about at 150 West, will more energy will be imparted to the jet. It'll take that split point and move it closer to the California coast. The real hope is that from a precipitation standpoint, that that split it comes fully on shore and the storm door opens wide open with the deluge of water hitting the state. But given the westward displacement of this El Nino, we suspect the focus of the jet's activity is going to remain about where it's been, you know, with the split point oscillating somewhere between 135 west, about 600 miles off the coast, to out towards Hawaii. Um, but again, that's a guess. We'll see how this plays out. Anyway, so in active phase, expected to go into about the 23rd you know, or 4th of February. Then the storm door uh, or enhancement of the storm door starts with westerly anomalies on that time to continue the whole way through oh maybe the second week in March and then things back off and then after that well we really don't know actually this model was suggesting that another active phase would uh, occur in the April time frame but it's since backed off from that so it's a long ways away who knows um, equatorial Rossby wave activity there is some uh, suggestion that an uh, uh, equatorial Rossby wave is in play right now, at least per this model. But in terms of doing anything to support west wind production, not a whole lot. And again, our low pass filter here, which shows us the core of El Nino. The peak of it here, according to this one little tiny peak right here around the the uh, Halloween time frame, and then it backed off only to rebuild a little bit right here in the January time frame, and now another pulse again uh, is uh, forecast again in parallel with the active phase of the MJO. So we've talked about westerly winds in the West Pacific and their relation to the Madden Julian oscillation. And, of course, westerly winds, if it wasn't so late in the ENSO cycle, they would take warm water that's normally pulled up here, push it off to the east. But we've had four Kelvin waves, and the fifth one, that is that Kelvin wave is when warm water that's here in the west gets pushed in batches or in a bundle off to the east. That's called a Kelvin wave. And uh, eventually, if you have enough Kelvin waves, you take the warm pool that's normally all over here in the West Pacific. It starts moving east. So here we go. West Pacific here, East Pacific here, looking at depth down 200 meters. We clearly see a big pocket of, what is this, 29 degree Celsius um, water temperatures moving to the east and it's pretty much locked this is where it's been for a month or more now about 140 west with the 28 degree isotherm at 125 west uh, this speaks to the westward displacement of this el nino not as much warm water as one would typically expect moving into the galapagos and uh, uh, ecuador anomalies though differences in normal for this time of year really shows the picture where normally warm water would be all pulled up here. It's now cool water, and that is making some more progress. And again, now back to the east at about 150, 145, something like that west. But we had that big westerly wind burst that we had in the uh, early January time frame has created yet another Kelvin wave. All these warm temperatures here, 4 and 5 degrees Celsius anomalies, were all gone. Actually, look at that, 6 degrees Celsius uh, two weeks ago, and it, it has rebuilt that nicely. So the Kelvin wave did find some warm water here at the surface and started driving it and is still driving it to the east, forming yet another Kelvin wave. The expectation is this will make it to somewhere e uh, somewhere west of the Galapagos, stall, and then start gurgling up to the surface, creating a surface warm pool here. That is the hallmark of El Nino. Here is a high-res version of that same uh, picture, clearly showing the cool pool. But what's really interesting here, this little pocket here is the last remnants of Kelvin wave number four. All this was not here 
Uh, a week ago, there was little pockets. The week before that, there was absolutely nothing. And it looked like El Nino was just over and done with in terms of a subsurface warming perspective. But now, all of a sudden, we have a nice pocket of 5-degree anomalies with a little po uh, portion of 6-degree anomalies here, all moving towards the east. At some point, we expect these 4-degree anomalies to start reaching up to the surface here, and you'll see that on the surface anomaly charts. We'll see warm water start to all of a sudden magically materialize on the surface, all that coming from this subsurface warm pool. And here we go with sea surface height anomalies. Differences in normal for this time of the year, and this is not temperatures, but strip out all the waves, strip, strip, strip out all the chop. Oh, Jason 2 satellite data here, and just see if there's a bulge on the ocean surface and clearly there is 15 centimeter anomalies this was much smaller two little lobes at the last report last week now it's one good size pocket if we were to get some 20 centimeter anomalies here that would be just too good to ask for and we're not asking for it we're impressed enough with this as it is what this suggests is warm water at depth. Warm water at depth, of course, expands, and that pushes the surface upward. 15-centimeter uh, anomalies here, and it just, you know, this is pretty much back to where we were with Kelvin wave number four, so very solid indeed. And, of course, our favorite chart, the upper ocean heat anomalies, basically it, it shows... Uh, over time, what's going on subsurface, and these are pockets of warm water here. You can see this is literally a Kelvin wave from a westerly wind burst in the March time frame of last year, 2015, working its way across Kelvin wave number two in the May-June time frame, massive Kelvin wave number three in the August-September time frame, even larger Kelvin wave number four. Four, that was in the uh, Novemberish time frame because, and I say larger because one, two, three, 40 uh, um, um, degrees of width at any point in time across here, except when it started to fade out, of course. Very large. And now the real interesting thing here is Kelvin wave number five. We do not expect to see two and a half degree anomalies on this one, but who knows? Maybe we'll get lucky. But still, even two degree, two to two and a half degree anomalies here from 150 was a 10, 20, 30, uh, what is that, about, oh, about 32 degree, uh, degrees in width, so uh, about 18, uh, almost 2,000 nautical miles across, pretty good for this late in the season, and this guy won't even erupt, we're going to just say a two-month uh, eruption cycle, so because it's, we do not expect it to make it to the Galap uh, east of the Galapagos. So normally we'd say three months, but two months here, it'll start erupting somewhere uh, west of the Galapagos. Uh, that'd be the March 1st time frame. Uh, that would be impressive. So that's really going to help this El Nino hang on a little bit longer. So we've talked about westerly winds here in the Kelvin wave generation area over here that create Kelvin waves. Then those Kelvin waves, pocket of warm water travels under the equator, making it, well, normally it would be in this area, but this year it's in this area. It starts erupting around here, coming up to the surface. The trades, remember we saw that, start continue blow here. They take that warm water and push it off to the west and create a warm pool. And that's exactly what we see here as of January 31st, a two and a half degree averaged warm pool roughly right here this is class pretty much classic El Nino westward displaced classic El Nino but certainly not Madoki El Nino that if that were the case it would just be way out here this is just sort of a sort of a hybrid if you will but still very impressive nonetheless so we'll go sector by sector. Here is the Nino 1.2 region, that area between the Galapagos and Ecuador. Here you'd normally expect to see a lot of warm water in here if this was a real classic El Nino. But as of February 1st, pretty much not a whole lot going on. One little pocket left at 2.25 degree anomalies. And even the 1.75s, I mean, most of this temperature is in about the 1.5 degree range. Here's where we were a week ago, and you can see... That pattern is just getting weaker, and the reality is this has been going on for months. Nino 1.2 is not in play in this El Nino. But Nino 3.4 certainly is. So this is the Galapagos are just off the uh, image right here, going out almost towards the dateline. A new building pocket of, what is that, two and, a half, two and a quarter degree anomalies with almost some hints of four degree anomalies starting to show here. Let's go back a week. And you can see the pattern was a little bit more diffuse. 
Now it's getting more consolidated again in the Nino 3.4, heart of the Nino 3.4, that is 120 out to about 170. Uh, so reinforcements are on the way already. And then the final sector going from about 155 west out to the dateline. Again, part of the warm pool looking very solid. If we go back a week, you can see, if anything, it's building out here. Again, so Nino 3.4 is fully in play as of this moment. And here's the mid-zoomed image. It doesn't show you anything in particular. So, But if we go back, here's really, this is what we're looking for, is four-degree anomalies here in little pockets of five degrees. This is back in November when, when uh, Kelvin Wave 4 was really doing its thing. But now things have settled down. The eruption parts, ports have disappeared. But we ex we're going to continue to monitor this area right here because we expect to start seeing four-degree anomalies somewhere oh, in the late February time frame, something to look forward to at least. And finally, the trend, the seven-day trend, oh, looking over rather than manually going sector by sector, we see a little pocket of warm anomalies here between Galapagos and Ecuador, nothing impressive, and a little bit of warming here west of the Galapagos out to about 120 west or so. But again, nothing too impressive. So we've talked about westerly wind anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. We've talked about Kelvin waves in the subsurface warm pool profile. We've talked about the surface water warm profile, but none of this means anything if it doesn't start impacting the atmosphere. Well, uh, clearly looking at the jet stream, we know the jet stream is very healthy, and that's a great sign. Some other data we can look at, Southern Oscillation Index differences in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. It, negative numbers here suggest the active phase of the MJO. This is the daily index. And a prolonged run of negative numbers, like what we're looking at here, suggests at least the active phase of the MJO, if not El Nino. Clearly, we are in El Nino. No argument there, but notice the trend the past week has been for the numbers to start returning more towards neutral. This is, again, the uh, impacts of the inactive phase of the MJO over the Dateline equ uh, Equator region. The 30-day running average, which got very healthy down to about minus 24 there uh, late January, thanks to the active phase of the MJO, is now starting to retreat, but still at minus 20. That's very healthy indeed. The 90-day running average, we want to see that down around minus 15, currently at minus 11.84, still not bad, suggesting a pretty healthy El Nino. Graphically, we can look at the 30-day SOI. We can go back to January 2014 when this El Nino first started. This was a false start El Nino through 2014, though really from an SOI perspective, it almost looks like a full-on El Nino. And then it continued into 2015. And notice here, you can see spikes in the MJO the whole way through it. Here we are in 2015 into 2016. We had a kind of a inactive phase here. And then recently, the big uh, active phase, it pushed us well negative from late December into about mid-January. And now we're starting the run up to the uh, inactive phase of the MJO, at least as manifest through the 30-day SOI. The ESPI is another way of measuring El Nino's effects on the atmosphere. Again, this is based on rainfall anomalies uh, between this area here uh, over uh, uh, Indonesia and then the Pacific because the warm pool is basically right in this area here. Precipitation is enhanced above it if it's strong. And so the difference between the two, you can build an index from that. The current value is 1.85. Uh, that is actually a very good correlation. It was up to 2.33 a couple weeks ago and has slowly been backing off. Given where we are in the El Nino uh, life cycle, one would expect it to be significantly lower than this and sort of falling apart, but instead it's holding together very nicely. There is our, our the focus of our precipitation anomalies right here. Notice it's south of Hawaii, and as you start working your way off the U.S. west coast where the jet stream splits, the precipitation also is weaker in that area. This also speaks to not such warm temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region. And finally, the forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, the main area for um, 
tracking El Nino. The forecast suggests temperatures occur. We are uh, right about, oh, February, right about in here. Temperatures to be dropping from this point forward. And uh, But still, um, it's half a degree above normal is considered El Nino. So we're way, way beyond that. Very warm indeed, but still a steady decline expected through April and notice this almost looks like it's picking up that Kelvin wave number five. And no, it, the the uh, steepness or the slope of the of the downcline or de decline sort of levels off here for a little bit as Kelvin wave number five hits, and then it continues to fall downward to about half a degree in July. The interesting part about this, and this is from the CFS version two model, which is we consider a pretty good model and doing a good has a pretty good handle on this El Nino. Notice the upward trend as we move into fall. Now we don't believe that for a second, but it's a nice little tease. The expectation is you'd crash into a full-on La Nina after a strong or nearly a super El Nino, but this model isn't picking up on that, at least not yet. And real quickly, we forgot to do this earlier, the Nino 1.2, uh, just the trend for water temperatures, you can see it's kind of not real good, 1.66 or 1.644 as of today, uh, kind of toggling around, not near where it was, and even though at its best, it wasn't uh, particularly warm. But Nino 3.4 today at 2 point three three four degrees right here down some from its big peak back here in the november time frame but still within eh, about three quarters of a degree of the peak and this out in february and with another kelvin wave on the way very impressive indeed much longevity to this el nino if maybe not explosive in terms of its uh, uh development it kind of meandered and took its sweet time going and you know what that's what's sort of been reflected in the jet stream it took a while for the jet stream this year to get in key and tuned up but now that it's in place the storm uh, production machine is like a machine and doing very well. So to wrap this up, we have another storm, storm number eight, forming in the Gulf of Alaska. 60 knot winds, 50 foot seas again forecast, split jet stream over the U.S. West Coast courtesy of the inactive phase of the MJO. Maybe a little bit of a break in the weather pattern for the next two to three weeks, but then the expectation is rain will continue. Uh, the question is, where's the dividing line? Will it be uh, Monterey Bay northward or will it be a little bit further south? Hard to tell, but maybe, maybe as we get deeper into El Nino, that line will travel a little bit further south. Good, healthy snowpack in the Sierra right now, looking very good. So we have some water reservoir there. More rain is needed, though, into the Golden State. Long term, active phase of the MJO is supposed to take over come about uh, the end of February, and then the storm track again will get a good little boost. So that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week, same time, same channel. Yeah, we say that every week, and we, we missed it by one day this week. Um, had to go get some snow, um, but w again, we're going to try to stay on track and have this out Sunday night as usual of next week. Thanks for watching. Do it again, same time, same channel, next week.